What's up, you guys? Sean Ross Sapp here for the Fightful.com podcast. This was completely unadvertised, but I, I was able to wake up this morning after UFC in Auckland and watch the Okada Omega rematch. Wanted to do a little podcast, a mini podcast of sorts on that. Haven't been able to watch the rest of the show. Skip forward. Saw the main event because I, I didn't want to get spoiled, anything like that. Woke up kind of late because of all the uh, UFC Auckland coverage. If you all haven't checked out that podcast, it is over on Fightful.com, as is all of our podcasts covering Raw, SmackDown, The List, and your boy on Wednesdays, post-pay-per-views. I think we'll probably do some uh, shows after the upcoming New Japan shows in America. I would like to at least. It's going to be a very, very busy time with International Fight Week and, and whatnot, but looking to at least give give fair play to that. This Okada Omega match was outstanding. I had it rated personally a 9 out of 10. I thought it was a touch below their last one, but all, all that's subjective. This was really, really good. It was on their New Japan Dominion show early this morning, 3 a.m. Eastern. I think this match probably ended up happening at like 7 a.m., our boy David T's covered it over at Fightful.com, so always go over there and check that out. Use our forums, all that good stuff. Loving Fightful.com, loving the love that you all give to Fightful.com. So definitely keep checking that out. Share our stuff, share our stories. All that really, really helps. Uh, Shout-outs to Dave Meltzer for uh, giving some publicity to the article that Brandon Howard wrote a couple of days ago, much appreciated. This match, you guys, went to a 60-minute draw. So you, if you click the link, you're going to get spoiled. Sorry to say. Went 60 minutes. Now, the thing was, a lot of people wondered if this was too early to book a rematch between Omega and Okada, especially to give it like a definitive answer of who's going to win this rematch. But what they did is they were able to stretch it. If they want to come back in a few months, they can. If they want to save it for the Tokyo Dome, they can. Omega thinks that Okada is basically the corporate champion, that New Japan wants him to be champion. Feels a little wronged. In the first match, there was the story that Okada lost, but it was one of the greatest matches of all time, and he didn't land his finish during that match. He wasn't able to hit the, the one-winged angel. So you had that already ready to go. That was That was there. But they made a story out of a drop kick. Out of a drop kick, they made it a story that they can go to in the future and paint a big question mark around. That's remarkable. First off, I will mention a couple of the problems I had with the match, why it wasn't maybe a 10 out of 10. Commentary at times hurt a little bit. I like Kevin Kelly. He's, he's just fine. Don Callis, I think, is pretty good. But they started to talk early on about how it was a six-star match the first time. And about who was more responsible for the match. That, that is a little weird for me. I'm all for blurring the lines between kayfabe and stuff. But a match rating like that, like I would not want them to say, well, Sean Ross Sapp rated this match a 9 out of 10 the next time. I don't want that. It's not. I don't like that. That blurs the line. I, the thing is, it's supposed to be a show about wrestling. So ideally, if Kenny Omega could knock Okada out in five seconds, he would. That wouldn't get a match rating at all. That was that was kind of weird to uh, to bring that up and say he could have that match in his sleep. Well, ideally, he wouldn't want to have that match in his sleep. Ideally, he would want to catch Okada in a guillotine and choke him out in 10 seconds and walk out with a championship. He wouldn't want to have that match in his sleep if this were, were real. Uh, other than that, uh, initially when they when they did the strike cha- trades, I I don't I think that's a little overdone, especially in this match. But I think they recognized that and they adjusted it. And in doing so, they made they made Oka or Omega like this pretty nice striker. Like they they had this situation where he dropped Okada with. A forearm where he dropped him with with a chop. People are saying Naito wins the G1 this year. Uh, guys, as we've seen in years past, we don't know who's winning the G1. They might switch it. They're gonna they're they're pretty good at doing whatever's best. But Omega in these strike exchanges, like I hate it when a guy eats one and turns around, looks at the crowd, like, oh, can you believe this? But 
what Omega did was just absolutely drop Okada in a couple of these. That was a good change. I really liked that for a spot that I thought was a little contrived. Really brought it back. It's it's just great. It, it was really good. Also, one of the commentary things I didn't like was Callus saying, uh, Omega takes a powder outside. That's when you go outside, but there was no explanation of that. That's an inside term. Powder out is an inside term that uh, should probably be addressed. Okada gets hit with the one-winged angel during the match. Some of this is going to be out of order. My apologies. It was an hour. But he was in the ropes. That's the only time Omega hit the move. So Omega would have gotten the pin if it were in the middle of the ring. This Japanese crowd was was outstanding, both like before, during, after. If this happens somewhere else, you know, maybe maybe it gets maybe it gets booze for an hour and then it ends in a draw. Not in Japan, it went it went over very well. Cody came in at one point, Cody Rhodes, and tried to throw in the towel, but the young bucks were like, no, 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 not happening, not happening. I don't know what that means. I don't know if he's trying to get the one up on Kenny Omega or if he was legitimately worried about him, but that's a question mark that I have too. And I haven't watched all the the post post fight or anything like that uh, or the post match. So there, there's a lot for me to catch up on. This was this was pretty cool stuff because that that paints another that's another branch that goes off of the tree that that we have to look at in the future. Ultimately, Cody tosses the towel into Omega so he can do his wipe down thing and and point and set up his move. There were there was the tease of the dragon suplex and especially the super dragon suplex. I'm a big fan of Omega's snap dragon suplex. I think it's actually a lot safer than a regular dragon suplex because he's able to slide his body underneath and then uh, his opponents are able to land on his back safely. Well, I don't think New Japan is going to go like all the way safe. On a lot of their moves, they're they're going to get a little bit safer because of what happened. Uh, Adam Ball asked, "Do you think Cyrus assumes this uh, new the subscribers of New Japan are smart fans? Therefore, it doesn't need to explain. You should never assume your fans are smart fans and use stuff like that. Like you shouldn't ever do that. I mean, I would, yeah. I mean, generally they are, but still, you, you, it's it's a topic that's kind of kind of sensitive." But it doesn't matter if it's only hardcore fans. It doesn't. You, like if I would have said, look at them. They're working a hell of a match. Oh, that's pretty dumb. Like there was Bill Simmons a few years ago on on Raw. He, he did commentary with JBL, and he looked over at JBL, and he said, didn't you put over John Cena at WrestleMania one year? Like, man, that's that would be like if Walter White was in the middle of an episode of Breaking Bad and said, like in the middle of a meth deal, looked over and said, we got nominated for a Teen Choice Award. You don't do that. That's that's a little unusual. And I'm sure, you know, I'm sure they're both good enough to where if if they think it's a problem, they will assess it and fix it. But it just took it down a little bit for me. So we had the Cody throwing in the towel thing. Interesting. Teases a little bit of dissension between he and uh, Omega, perhaps. The table not breaking. Well, while I had those problems with commentary early, the table not breaking and Don Callis addressing that was very good. There was a situation where Omega was on the table laid out, and they, they did a great job of teasing that table spot because of the, the, the now famous back body drop through the table that Omega took in January. Omega is laid out across the <laughs> across the table and Okada does his elbow drop through it, but it doesn't break all the way. That was rough. That had to, that had to suck for uh, Okada, but Callis did a good job explaining. It probably would have been better for uh, Omega if the table did break because that was, that was some extra force underneath his body that he got sandwiched between. That, that was very good. I like that. But uh, the tease of the dragon suplex was good. The tease of the, the table was very good. Omega striking where they, they made it seem like he could just chop a guy down with one, one single chop, not to, not to sound redundant. There was another really cool spot where 
Omega is pointing at Okada and he's threatening, you know, he's doing the, the bullet club taunt. Okada grabs him and does basically a short arm rainmaker. So that's so that's like and it's already a short arm clothesline, but he did like a short rainmaker and damn he knocked the hell out of Okada oh, of, of Omega. Getting my O's mixed up. That was really cool. They were able to to get enough distance in between each other after big moves like that to where they could lay down and sell it. Guys, leave us a thumbs up on this video, please. Also, subscribe, all that good stuff. And, and that can sometimes be a problem because if you do a big move like that and you're right next to each other, you're almost obligated. It looks bad if you don't roll over and pin the guy. They got enough distance in between themselves to where it made sense that they were selling on opposite ends of the ring, and that's a pretty big ring they have over there. Somebody says, Sean Cody challenged Okada for Long Beach. Might be good. I don't know. I'm not, you know, Cody Rhodes in the ring. We'll see, but if he's in there with, if he's in there with uh, Okada, Omega, anybody like that, I think that he'll do very, very well. But there, there were a little, a few nuances, and it's funny because when I went and skipped forward to this match, I saw that there was like an hour and a half left in the show, and in my mind, I'm thinking, is this going to go like that long? Is this going to go all the way? But for some reason, I didn't think it would because there's a lot of hullabaloo after uh, NJPW shows, so. This is how they get it to the Tokyo Dome, though. They, they stretched it out. They made it good. There are questions for Long Beach, uh, which interested to see how things will play out as it pertains to those shows. I know one of them is going to run on access. We'll see. We'll see how they work out. The drop kick was a cool story that I thought they told. Okada hit him with like five or six drop kicks, and usually that's that's a big no no in professional wrestling like traditional but as we've seen recently and check out that article by brandon howard some of those like unwritten rules are kind of meant to be broken and in this event it it just told a great story to the point to where by the last one that basically caused the draw don Callis goes that goddamn drop kick because okada throws one hell of a drop kick and at no point did he miss a drop kick did he have his drop kicks like prevented Omega couldn't stop the drop kick one of the most elementary moves that has become a staple in Okada's arsenal so that's that's a big thing that they can like another question mark that you paint will Omega be able to stop the drop kick and to many it seems like inconsequential it doesn't seem that important but in MMA, we see it all the time. Like, can they stop the leg kicks? Can they stop the footwork? Like, really elementary things that you would think that a high-level guy should be able to stop. They're just not able to stop. And that's that's one for Omega. All this work he's put in, and he was, a, he was pretty much foiled by a drop kick. And he was pretty much foiled by that drop kick once every 10 minutes. Speaking of drop kicks, there are so many times you all hear me harp on front drop kicks. Ben Balor's in particular. Finn Balor's outside the ring in particular. If they look like Okada's and they sell like Omega did, you probably won't see me complaining because the impact is perfect and it doesn't look like the person giving the move is hurting more than the person taking the move. That is instrumental. There are some moves like you, I know a lot of people say end of days. It looks like a guy's taking a back bump. Yeah, but you got a guy swinging all the way around and then back and a 250 pound guy doing it. So. <sighs> I'm very, very interested to see where that goes. Somebody asked if I think Toriano can draw money. I'm sure he has in some degree. I don't know. Yeah, overall, I think that this this match was outstanding. I thought it was great booking. The crowd there wasn't unhappy. I have not seen anybody else unhappy that this went to a draw. A 9 out of 10 match for me would have been a little bit higher with different commentary. I didn't think it was as good as Tokyo Dome, but but that's like saying that's like saying that <laughs> that the the 97 Bulls aren't as good as the 96 Bulls. You know what I mean? Like they're both really really great. They're both awesome. 
Guys, we are back Monday after Raw, Tuesday after SmackDown. We have the Holy Smokes MMA podcast. If you all haven't checked out the MMA podcasts on Fightful, please give it a go. We have people like Frank Trigg, Burt Watson, Elias Theodoru, Sean Pearson uh, lending their thoughts as well. A lot of those guys are still in that Fightful family. And, of course, the list and your boy every week. Also, check out tomorrow morning a new Most Ridiculous with Anna Bauer drops. Very excited for that. Next weekend, we have Money in the Bank. Uh, Saturday, we have UFC from Singapore. That show is a very underrated show. There's a lot of good fights on that show. We'll be bringing you all that sometime in the afternoon because the show starts at 4.30, so we need a little time to catch up. Where does Omega go from here? That's that's a good question. I, I think they should. Uh, this These should be the guys. They're, they're very fortunate. They have Okada, Omega, Naito especially, that are just there are just there, and they they are ready to be those guys. Before they had, they had Okada, Tanahashi, Nakamura, and Tanahashi's seen better days. He's, he's getting up there. They lost Nakamura, and for a much shorter term, you know, of course they had AJ Styles. He left. But having those three guys to plug in up there, ooh, that's good. That's very, very good. That's that's a really nice situation to have is if you have such an exodus as they have had that you can just rotate and Kenny Omega stepped up. And I remember last year when people are thinking, I don't know if Kenny Omega's the guy. I don't know if he's that guy. I don't know how anybody thought he couldn't be the guy. Like he can work serious. He can work comedy. He can work. He can work any style you want him to work. And Okada adapts to anything as well. And I like them for much different reasons. As it pertains to Okada, you don't see a lot of different things in his matches. But he, as I said last week, he has the reputation that I think Randy Orton may unjustly have. That he's just so good. He knows where to put everything in a match to make it really great. Uh I don't think Randy Orton's had that for quite a while. Maybe when he's really, really motivated and wants to switch things up. Omega, on the other hand, like every match you'll see him do something different. Like not just a new move. Maybe he does a move in a different way. Maybe he sells in a different way. Maybe he takes a tumble in a way that you haven't seen before or you rarely see before. And I think that goes a long way in professional wrestling where a lot of what you see is paint by numbers. And a lot of it's paint by numbers because – Muscle memory, travel, trying to trying to work hurt, a lot of that stuff. It's it's not that easy to do that, and that's why you get a lot of the redundant activity in the ring. And Omega is not about that redundant activity in the ring. Yeah, uh, somebody says Kenny could make Reigns look outstanding. Reigns makes himself look outstanding. Don't be ridiculous. Just because this is a New Japan show doesn't mean you can be ridiculous. Roman Reigns is a fine pro wrestler. He and Kenny Omega would have an awesome match. Uh, regardless of who was calling it, it would be a very awesome match. Guys, I want to thank you all so much for joining me for this impromptu show. I know it was like out of the blue, didn't advertise it or anything, but I watched that match and wanted to address it because I thought it was very, very good. Please check out those MMA shows as well. Uh, really appreciate you all coming and talking to us for the, the Auckland show. Of course, we have live coverage of everything. Head over to Fightful.com. I know some of you haven't been there before, but uh, we give you something different than you'll see in any pro wrestling MMA boxing site every day. You'll see at least a few things that you just won't find anywhere else. Uh, make sure to like, subscribe, share us. All that stuff really helps. But I want to thank you all so much. Uh, your support has been awesome over the past 11 months now. We're going up on our one-year anniversary we have some cool stuff coming in the works to Fightful.com, so check that out. Thank you guys so much. Till next time, we're out.